Good morning, everybody. It's your favorite aspiring revolutionary here, a wandering author, reminding you that we are all the authors of our own lives. As always, my message remains the same. Spend less, live more, earn your freedom with frugality. And today we're going over question number 11 from the Summa Theologica, written by St. Thomas, which covers the unity of God. After considering the nature of God and his eternal being, we now look at his unity. St. Thomas approaches this via four points of inquiry. One, whether one adds anything to being. Two, whether one and many are opposed to each other. Three, whether God is one. And four, whether he is in the highest degree one. This is similar to the earlier question in, Aquin in Aquinas' Summa, where he asked if God was composite. The big difference here is whether God is a single being or multiple. So, question 11, article 1. Whether one adds anything to being. Opponents say the concept of one seems to add something to being. A genus determines everything, and one belongs to the genera of quantity. Thus, one seems to tell us the number of being. Which is true in a certain respect. It can be used as a quantifier. Furthermore, if one is not an addition to being, they must be identical. But we should not need separate terms if this were the case. So one must add something to being. Now, on the contrary, Dionysius states, nothing which exists is not in some way one. This could not be true if one added something to being in the sense of a limitation, so it must not be in addition to being. For Aquinas, one adds nothing to the reality of being, but merely negates division. It signifies wholeness, therefore one is the same as being. Beings can be either simple or compound, and simple things are undivided, both in potential and in actuality. Compound objects lack being when divided, only after their parts are put together. This shows us how anything's being is manifested in undivision. So all things guard unity as they guard being. Two opinions exist regarding the convertibility of the one with being. Pythagoras and, Plato, and Plato both saw that the one as a principal number represented undivided substance. They believed that since the number was a representation of unity, all numbers were the substance of all. They, they, since the number was a representation of unity, they thought numbers were the substance of all. Avicenna considered that one as the principal number did add something to being, such as the color does to hair. However, it is manifest that this is false, as things are one by their substance. One as, one as represents quantity does add something to being, but as it refers to substance, it does not. Although something may be divided in one regard, that does not prevent its unity in another. For example, a group of animals could be many, though they are unified but belonging to the same species. Therefore, objects may be undivided according to its essence, yet divided according to what is outside its essence. This is why Dionysius said that there is no kind of multitude that is not in a way one. But what are many in their parts are, in one, are one in their whole. And what are many in accidents are one in subject. And what are many in number are one in species. And what are many in species are one in genus. And what are many in processions are one in principle. Whether one and many are opposed to each other. <clears throat> so we're going to start with a couple of opposing viewpoints. It appears that one and many are not mutually opposed because nothing is predicated of its opposite. On the contrary, every multitude is in some way one, as was shown in the previous article. Furthermore, nothing is composed of its opposite, yet a multitude is composed of one many times over. One is opposed to one, but few is in opposition to many, thus one is not opposed to many. If one were opposed to multitude, it would be in the same way as the undivided is to the divided. Therefore, it would be as privation is to have it. On the contrary, though, or on the other hand, when things oppose each other in idea, they also are in opposition in reality. The idea of one, like the concept of one as being, contains the concept of the indivisible, while the multitude has division. Thus, Aquinas says the one and the multitude are opposed, because they have these oppositions in the idea. One is opposed to many in a variety of ways. One as a number is opposed to multitude as a number, just like the measure of something is to what is measured. One as a primary measure, one is a primary measure and is what measures a multitude. However, one as one as refers to being is in opposition opposition to the multitude by way of privation. 
privation never takes away from a thing's being entirely. Insofar as privation means negation in the subject. However, each privation does take away some being, but this is based in the foundation of being. Since the one and the good are convertible with being, then the privation of good is also founded in some good. Similarly, to remove unity, we, begin, we must begin with some one thing. Aquinas states, Hence it happens that the multitude is some one thing, and evil is some good thing, and non-being is some kind of being. A whole, is two, two, a whole is twofold. On the one hand, it is homogeneous and composed of identical parts. Yet it can also be heterogeneous and composed of disparate parts. When we look at homogeneous wholes, their parts are a semblance of the whole, such as how every part of water is water. Yet when we look at a heterogeneous whole, this is different. Not one, no one part of a house resembles the whole house in its entirety. A multitude is this type of whole. One is opposed to many privately, as the concept of many involves division. Thus, division must be prior to unity, at least in our way of apprehension. We understand complex things by way of the simple. Take a point, for example. Points are that which has no part. Question 11, Article 3. Whether God is one. There are two objections to the question of whether God is one. First, it was written in 1 Corinthians 8.5, For there be many gods and many lords. Second, one as a number does not seem like it could be derived from God, since quantity is not predicated of him. Some also argue that oneness of being is not convertible with God, because this implies privation, and every privation is an imperfection. And imperfections may not apply to God. Thus, they say that God cannot be one. However, in the book of De Deuteronomy 6.4, it was written, Hear, to I Hear O Israel! The Lord our God is one Lord. St. Thomas adds that God's oneness can be proven from three sources. First, we can look at the argument from his simplicity, which Aquinas explored in his previous questions. The reason anything can be said to be a particular thing and not another is because it cannot be applied to many. If we look at Socrates, for example, we can say that he is one man because his attributes may not be applied to many. We can also see that his unique traits mean there may not be multiple Socrates in the same way. Likewise, God is, is his own nature, as was shown in question 3. So in the same way, God is God, and he is this God, and it is impossible for many gods to exist. Second, we can look to what St. Thomas calls the infinity of his perfection. In the second article of question 4, it was shown that God comprehends in himself the whole perfection of being. If there were more than one God, they would be different from each other, and one would possess what another did not. This is a type of privation, implying that at least one of them would not be absolutely perfect. Therefore, it is impossible for many gods to exist, and when ancient philosophers postulated infinite principles, they would assert only one such principle. Thirdly, we can look to the unity of the world. Everything that exists is ordered to each other. And since diverse things only harmonize in the same order, if they are ordered by one, many are reduced into a singular order, better by one than by many. One is the per se cause of one, meaning not everything in the series has the first property. On the other hand, Many can only be an accident, the accidental cause of one, insofar as they are one in some way. Meaning, like, uh, you know, you look at a flock of geese, and the entire flock can be thought of as one in some way, but there's actually multiple geese composing that multitude. What is first is most perfect, per se, and not accidentally. It follows that the first, which reduces all into one order, should only be one, and this is God. Gods have been called many by mistake. Our ancestors worshipped numerous deities and thought the planets and astral bodies were gods. One as a number is not of God, but rather of the world. It is a principle of mathematics, and math is material in being, and only abstracted in idea. One as being is a metaphorical, metaphysical concept and does not depend on matter. Yet even though there is no privation in God, we may only apprehend him through privation and remotion. Therefore, there is no reason privation cannot be predicated of him, even though there is none in him, such as his incorporeal and infinite being. And in this way, he may be said to be one. 
Question 11, Article 4. Whether God is supremely one. Now, several lines of thought oppose the view that God is supremely one. Some say that one is derived from the privation of division, and that there is no greater or lesser in privation. In other words, God cannot be more or less one. Then other things are one according to this view. Further, nothing appears to be more ind indivisible than what is indivisible actually and potentially, like the concept of a point or unity. However, something could only be said to be more one if it were more indivisible. So this view states that God is not more one than unity or a point. Finally, the essential good should also be the supreme good, and the essential one would likewise be the supreme one. Yet Aristotle says in the fourth book of his Metaphysics that each being is essentially one. From this perspective, it would appear that every being is supremely one, and that God is not more one than anything else. On the contrary, Bernard says, among all things called one, the unity of the divine trinity holds the first place. St. Thomas responds that one is an undivided being. So for something to be supremely one, it must also be supremely being. It must be supremely undivided as well. Now God is the, is the supreme being, so both of these belong to him. His being is not determined by anything but himself, since he is being itself. Previously, it was shown that God is the supreme simplicity, so he is not divided by any mode of division, and this makes him one in the supreme degree. Even though we do consider privation to be subject to degrees of more or less directly, we can do so through an examination of its opposite. Thus, when a thing is more or less divisible, it may be called more or less supremely one. If we look at the concepts of a point or unity, we can say they refer to mathematics, and not metaphysics. As such, they only have being in some subject, and are not the supreme manifestation of being. Finally, even though all beings are unified substance by substance, not every substance is equally unified. Some things are compound, while others are simple. And that concludes today's video. Uh, this is a wandering author here calling at you from Steels Creek in Bristol, Tennessee, saying, um, what are you guys doing in order to inspire, uplift, and empower your local community today? Because this world isn't changing unless we all do our part. And you can count on me to do mine daily. Until next time, love y'all.